Hello everyone, my name is Don Stacy. I'm going to read the last two stories from my science fiction collection, Tales of the Bizarre and Unnatural. The second to the last story is titled, The Invention of Man. During the second decade of the 22nd century, a political faction known as the Luddites arose in esteem and recognition and gained power. When every reasonable effort to ban the burning of coal, oil, and gasoline failed in the parliaments and congresses across the world, <clears throat> the carbon dioxide uh, from this burning continued to enclose the earth in a heat emitting blanket as thick as the atmosphere, sending a good deal of infrared or heat energy back to the Earth's surface. This had been an intractable transgenerational problem since we, as a single people, the human inhabitants of Earth, first became aware that we were going about our merry way when, in actuality, endangering billions of people for generations to come. The Luddites uh, were a coalition of eco-terrorists, urban engineers, progressive politicians, educators, labor groups, and uh, the many concerned enough, though unaffiliated, all of whom had obtained an education which portrayed science on the forefront of every new sterling invention and discovery. Many of them were university trained and had an appreciation for our subtlety in both art and politics. The education of young people was crucial to winning this war against some of capitalism's most powerful organizations. They had studied uh, the perceived efficacy of two printings of a United States history textbook which occurred exactly 100 years ago. One for our schools in California and uh, the other for schools in Texas. In those days, historical events could never be seen in a single light. But this problem had to be understood in terms a 12-year-old child could appreciate. And the Luddites understood that precisely because of the transgenerational nature of the problem, the science textbook, textbooks in junior high school were crucial to a political solution. Dubious parents could learn from their children after seeing photographs from their child's <coughs> general science text showing enormous slabs of ice shear off from a cliff face and drop into the ice-strewn waters of the Arctic and Antarctic Oceans. Yet states uh, make their own decisions about uh, school books and there are 50 superintendents of public instruction who make these choices regarding science textbooks. High school biology classes uh, became arenas of public debate. There have been many court trials concerning these matters, the most well known, the Scopes trial. A man named Scopes had lost a job for giving a few lessons on heredity and Darwin's theory of evolution through what uh, the English gentleman scientist dubbed natural selection. The Texas science school books bordered on deficient with respect to the plainly observable phenomena of climate change. But the Luddites also saw a problem much deeper yet equally insidious, the lure of the smartphone. Hours of involvement each day with these phones, so direct face-to-face -face talk between people had diminished. But in the workaday world, this complex device has become inordinately vital, uh, which poses as the deepest intrusion of technology into human life yet. 
These handheld computers allow a positional surveillance of billions of people and give easy access to their personal information, behavior, and their messages between one another. Technology had come to mold human conduct on a mass scale. Possibilities of interconnectedness were staggering. The Luddites understood that uh, for our economy and our society to function, we must be made to want things that can be purchased. This is the essence, the very heart of capitalism. And because people frequently never fail to want more than what they have, companies large and small are pressed to grow, which means further extraction of finite resources. The people who composed this group came from all walks of life and from every religious persuasion. Their, <clears throat> their commonality lay in a respect for science and most of all, a respect for reason. Groups from all the various towns and cities communicated only by handwritten letters. And they devised several techniques to signal that uh, some inspection had taken place along the transit of a letter's delivery. And ultimately, they would face a formidable opponent, the FBI. But initially, they merely talked about the various ways one could uh, sabotage an oil refinery or a natural gas well. Uh, methane, almost 80 times more absorbent of infrared radiation than carbon dioxide every molecule of these gases vibrating faster than releasing their energies, warming the skies, warming the earth. They saw how slowly Elon Musk had made any headway. They realized a partial solution lay in a worldwide boycott of oil and natural gas. But only a sweeping movement with the trappings of a religion would be enough to induce people to commit such self-sacrifice as no longer driving a car or heating their house. Therefore, the only solution they saw was a two-pronged attack of a mass media campaign and sabotage, which would be designed to unleash a paralyzing worldwide economic cataclysm. Their theory was that uh, short of this economic catastrophe, which would cause the starvation of billions of people, the concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere would continue to increase unchecked. A man named David Rawlins uh, belonged to this group during the early days of its formation. He was a recently retired high school mathematics teacher who had lost his wife to cancer. During their last few weeks together before she died at home in her own bed, they talked about the need for immediate and effective action. They discussed uh, various approaches to the sabotage of oil refineries and land-based oil wells, how natural gas pipelines could be destroyed. They admitted to the problem of burning petroleum as a result of these bombings. They could not, uh, this could not be shrugged off as a matter of little consequence, perhaps far wiser in the long run to bomb the automobile factories. This uh, latter method would minimize the release of carbon dioxide. <clears throat> he pledged to his dying wife that he would strive to generate a movement, but there was a great irony in that he used the internet to find like-minded people. They held a web conference uh, where their techniques to distribute information and a monthly journal of essays and articles were first discussed. Once the journal had been established, they would no longer use the website for anything other than as a front door for newcomers. Rollins became one of the contributing editors to the journal, which uh, they called the Luddite Review. Another founding member was James Blackhawk, owner of a print shop in Pocatello, Idaho, where his birthright was as a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribe. He had previously been deeply committed to the ecology movement. He believed, as did Rollins, 
that human life had developed a global culture which has arisen from the economic trade between countries. Millions of people traveled in jet aircraft every year between countries, for example. Energy consumption had reached staggering proportions. There was only one method apart from widespread use of nuclear energy to avert a climate holocaust within the next two centuries. That method used hydrogen obtained from seawater through electrolysis powered by the vast arrays of solar panels in California and Oregon desert. Blackhawk had talked with some engineers who taught at the town's university. He had an unwavering conviction that this scheme could buttress and underpin global society's transformation. This was, from the perspective of the moon, a matter of indifference. Black Hawk had a strong sense of his forebears, his people who were on this land tens of thousands of years before the English and Europeans set foot on the shores of the Western Hemisphere. Black Hawk and Rollins began a correspondence whose collected letters later appeared in a book which became a national bestseller. Each man had his own writing style, their abiding interests and concerns diverged, but their dialogue became a unique contribution to American letters. David Rollins received the first letter of this correspondence dated January 21st, <coughs> 2120. James Blackhawk opens by saying, Greetings from Southeast Idaho. Well, David, uh, we have undertaken a name which would be dangerous to pursue. These uh, simultaneous bombings we intend to pull off some night, a year or two from now, when we are sufficiently organized, will awaken the entire security apparatus of the United States. All of us face the death penalty when we are caught. None of us want to be caught, of course. We all want to remain free to see what they will make of our ultimatum. Adopt our energy plan or expect more bombings and other acts of sabotage. Many people will suffer from the horrendous dislocations these well-orchestrated attacks will produce. They will all become our enemy. But we have no other means of compelling the government to meet our demands. I believe all of us are in uniform agreement on this point. We do not have the luxury to entertain doubts. At the same time, we must move forward with our plan of destruction very carefully. We must step back far enough to lose sight of individual suffering. And we must always remember that we do these crimes to produce a state of prolonged anarchy, during which time gasoline will have become a very rare commodity indeed. In principle, we know our actions are justified since governments seem powerless to eliminate fossil fuels from their economies. They leave us no choice. The extreme weather throughout the last century has only become more destructive and more terrifying with each passing year. Former coastal areas are now under the seas. Tornadoes scour the landscape like lasers run amok in an engraving factory. One-fifth of the country is underwater during flood season. The weather is going to lash down on us harder and harder from now on. Our cause is just. Yours, Jim. My respected compatriot, David Rollins, begins his letter to Blackhawk one week later. You say we must step back and lose sight of individual suffering. Unlike those people exactly a hundred years ago, who all understood what was happening, yet too many were tied to money, tied to their comfort and ceaseless consumption. Unlike them, we know precisely what weather they actually did produce because of their blind inaction. <clears throat> Agriculture grew increasingly difficult. Hailstorms battered down wheat and corn crops. Millions of pigs starved for lack of feed from corn. People went without meat except for the rich. Miami turned into another Venice. Hundreds of thousands of people in the United States died of starvation and pneumonia and the worldwide flu and coronavirus pandemics. Life had become increasingly treacherous and challenging. For many people, a single weather event such as heavy rains and subsequent flooding 
or a tornado which carves out a random path of destruction. A single event, heavy continuous rain, uh -huh, and hundreds of thousands of people are dislocated. They become extreme weather refugees. We have persisted in living like this for a century, and there seems no end in sight even now. Earth is no longer the island paradise compared to its two nearest neighbors, Venus and Mars. And the forces of capitalism have continued to keep the oil industry and gas industries alive. When people began to see just how bought and paid for the Republican Party truly was, our movement set down its roots. Sadly, America has become a very wealthy, very powerful, very dysfunctional state. People had begun to see the Republican administrations were incompetent when it came to orchestrating disaster relief, and there's been a plain, quite visible pattern since the days of George W. Bush and Hurricane Katrina. Then there was Trump and Puerto Rico. Then there was an entire decade when we thought we were out of the woods only to be chastened by the following decades, especially in the 2080s when Sherman held the presidency, another scripture-spouting shill for capitalism. The entire Gulf Coast and all of Florida was submerged from a tsunami stirred from the monstrous hurricane which had been predicted, and the ensuing mass exodus has been our most uh, thoroughgoing test yet of our highway systems to handle a massive surge of traffic both uh, north and inland from the east coast. Those refugees eventually wound up in neighboring states with nowhere to go, with no friends or relatives to take them in. Now there is travel, but it is uh, very restricted. As we all know, the roads could not be repaired fast enough. Washed out bridges, mudslides, vicious hailstorms causing massive pileups, and still we burn oil and methane for electricity. Our wants, it would seem, cannot be collectively curtailed. The Luddite revolution will cause a great deal of upheaval, starvation, and death. We will have fomented the destruction of industrial society. Why? Because they will not implement our hydrogen energy policy. We pleaded with those sons of bitches in Washington, D.C., but they would not accept our proposal. They would not meet the necessary challenges of legislation that would have transformed our oil-based economy into one which would have led us out of this dark period. They have turned up their noses at our proposal, but very soon they will all wish they had done otherwise. Your brother in arms, David. After the Luddite Rebellion in late uh, 2121, a simultaneous attack in oil countries which had not adopted the Japanese approach to a hydrogen-based energy system, every country in the world except Japan was thrown into chaos. <laughs> The Luddites had no need to sabotage the energy infrastructure of Japan. Japanese society had foreseen this necessity, and they had worked in concert uh, toward achieving their aim, and they had become a beacon for the rest of the industrialized world. But the fearful, unseen interplay between market forces and conservative political principles could hobble any attempt to transform society, which cannot come about without common agreement and the diverse United States had not been politically nimble enough to adopt the Japanese model, which had been fully implemented by 2065. There is a good reason to understand the minds of these people who called themselves Luddites. They were guided by a terrifying vision of storms of massive destructive power before which we are helpless. That uh, the only safe shelter is an underground bunker, very much uh, because of the conservative American South and its people steeped in biblical myth, these frightful storms and floods grew in number and ferocity each year. The Luddite Rebellion was the result of nearly two years of secret planning. During that fateful evening when they had their first and only webcam conference, David Rollins, James Black, Hawk, Marsha McBride, and Rachel Montgomery formed the initial cell out of which their organization grew. Blackhawk printed and mailed uh, their material out to each member. Many more of them began to exchange letters. 
They knew they were conspiring to commit, commit serious felonies. Many have said treason. And they proceeded with great care and ingenuity. They anticipated their personal correspondence and the newsletter would eventually be brought to the FBI's attention. Vital or incriminating information had to be disguised, the rules of encryption buried deep within a seemingly ordinary letter. All of the Luddites adopted handwriting over the computer keyboard which precluded any sort of electronic surveillance. Even the simple old-fashioned typewriter they disallowed themselves. The act of using a pen for communication had importance to them for several reasons. Their, <clears throat> their correspondence was often burned if vital information had been sent, otherwise their letters were saved. For this reason we have an intimate history of their remarkable and grim story. Once they had gathered in number and fully coordinated their efforts, once they were fully prepared to strike there are thousands of targets across the globe. They contacted Washington, D.C. Some of their members worked in the various agencies and departments in the federal government. They understood how an invitation to see the president might be obtained. Their plan, as we all know, was to blindside the president in public, for by then uh, their numbers had grown to over 500,000 in the United States, with similar numbers in England and throughout Europe, Russia, China, and Australia. The two men and two women already mentioned met with him in the Rose Garden on a fine spring day. The press was there in a large contingent. The president introduced them and shook each of their hands. Then, speaking to the audience of cameramen and news reporters, he said, I want you all to know that the Smithsonian Museum has a place for all of uh, our Luddites' letters when they become famous. How does that sound, Mr. Rollins? Your group will be long remembered. Mr. President, Rollins replied, we're all honored by the Smithsonian's promise of future inclusion. But we have come not to accept this honor, but to meet you, Mr. President, to demand that you show leadership and forcefully back every piece of legislation needed to switch our country from oil to hydrogen. If you do not lead this steady march away from oil, as the Japanese have done, our organization will strike, and this will not be merely a single site. Hundreds of sites across America will be bombed. The president looked stunned only for a moment. Then a, a fury gripped him when he quickly realized they were serious. He glanced at one of his personal Secret Service agents. I want these people arrested, he said. Those bastards making me look like a lame fool in public. The four of them were escorted off the stage under heavy security. U.S. Marshals took them to a secure site for interrogation by the FBI. Each of them was placed in a separate prison cell, and each of them was interrogated for up to 16 hours a day. Several weeks passed, and they were finally released. The FBI had been unable to tease out any conspiracy of explicit instructions from the many letters they had intercepted, copied, and then sent on their way. The agency had created a task force to monitor the Luddites and subject their correspondence to analysis. The leader of this team was uh, Peter Obrecht, uh, their chief forensic scientist and a leading expert in cryptography. He had obtained a warrant from a federal judge to intercept the correspondence of these four people. He had read every letter the FBI had seized over the course of the next several months. He even had some affinity for their cause, but in the end they were just high-minded anarchists, dangerous criminals, and yet there was nothing the FBI could do. They had found no residues of any chemicals used in the manufacture of bombs. No, Obrecht thought, those people are still free to spread their philosophy of hatred for the machine. <clears throat> 